Right, good afternoon everybody. Um, I think we ought to get going. Um, so welcome to this, which I think is a joint CES and SLRG seminar. Um, um, I'm Matthew Leach. For those of you who are at SLRG and don't know me, um, involved with, uh, with CES. Um, Tim Jackson and, and others from SLRG send their apologies that he can't be here. Um, so that gives me the, the pleasure to introduce Bronwyn, um, who I've known for, for some time and uh, and absolutely delighted that she's come back to uh, back here to talk to us. So, Bronwyn Hayward uh, is a uh, New Zealander. She's going to give us a seminar in some ways of two halves, although I'm sure she'll find some clever ways to, to link the two together. Uh, the two halves being one to talk about some of the, uh, the experiences within New Zealand um, in light of the... Uh, the, the, the earthquakes and the tragedies that have happened over the past couple of years now, um, but in particular the recovery efforts that have been taking place in, in New Zealand and some of the difficulties of linking uh, environment and sustainability and people's rights and political developments kind of into that recovery process. So she's going to, I think, give us a few comments about the latest developments in New Zealand there, because she knows, I think, that a number of us are, have been following what's been going on in New Zealand anyway. Um, and then she's going to go and talk about, um, effectively, uh, her, her new book. And she's been blatantly handing out the self-publishing uh, uh, materials about the book. So please find a flyer and obviously then go all nine in order. Um, but she's going to talk about uh, the work that, that goes behind the book, which really plays to her own research strengths. So just briefly to introduce, so Bronwyn is a, a lecturer uh, within the University of Canterbury, a senior lecturer in political science. She's got a background in both political science and geography. Um, and she works uh, in, in a broad range of areas, but in particular uh, the issues facing young citizens in, in the world, but in particular linking to sustainability and environment. Um, she's been a visiting um, researcher here at the university for about four years, I suppose, since 2008, working with the Resolve program originally, working with Tim and others in Resolve. Um, she was here for a period of time, fairly elongated period of time, as part of that program. Then went back to New Zealand, uh, but we managed to kind of keep a part of her at least linked into uh, to the centre here uh, through a, an ongoing visiting relationship. So she has a visiting researcher position, and what's really nice is she, she's a visiting researcher who actually comes and visits. And so here she is, and I should stop whittering on and give you the uh, the chance to talk. Thanks. Thank you. Um, thanks very much, Matt. And it's really fantastic to be back at Surrey. I really appreciate the links, actually. For lots of reasons we'll talk about, it's been a very intellectually liberating and rich time. I think Surrey, CES, Resolve and, um, and now the Sustainable Lifestyles Groups are seeds of really important different conversations that have leading international implications. So what I'd like to do today is to talk for the next sort of 30 minutes really about three issues. Um, I'd like to touch base with where we're at in terms of our recovery in Christchurch from the earthquakes. In a way it's good also for me to get a break away to come and talk to you about our process of recovery. So just for a few minutes I'd like to talk about what's happening in Christchurch. But principally I'd like to then go back to a wider conversation about how the issues in Christchurch connect and resonate with the issues globally facing young citizens everywhere and three emerging models of citizenship um, that we're seeing in our, what we might call neoliberal democracies that are emerging. And I have been blatantly handing out the EarthScan Rutledge um, handouts. Thanks very much for your support because we're using half the profits of this uh, book for children's poverty projects in Christchurch after the quake. So um, to just begin by just telling you a little bit about my Turangawai or a place to stand. You'll know from September 2010, on the 4th of September when I was still here um, at Surrey and also with the Tyndall Centre for Climate Change at East Anglia, um, a 7.1 earthquake hit Christchurch which is my hometown of 350,000 people. It's the largest town in the um, South Island of New Zealand. We've got a population of about 4.3 million. Our carbon footprint is made much larger by estimates of up to a million other New Zealanders circling the globe at any time, but 4.3 million of us live in the country. Um, this earthquake that hit in the early hours of the morning didn't cause any fatalities at the time. A lot of that was to do with building standards, 
it appears, and literally the fact that people were at home in residential areas outside of the earthquake zone. But on uh, February last year, the um, 21st, um, at 12 o'clock, literally actually as our family was flying home from Surrey, the plane couldn't land because the city was hit with a 6.3 earthquake, which was only five kilometres under the city. And it resulted in the highest ground force velocity ever experienced in an urban area. So it doesn't, it's not so much the magnitude but the actual intensity. Um, being at lunchtime there were um, 185 deaths. One of the reasons that the deaths were so limited was partly because the inner city, which is close to where we live, was devastated but had been cordoned off. Another reason is that, um, that the bulk of the, of the fatalities that happened in the immediate effect of the earthquake were in two particular buildings which are now subject to royal inquiries and a lot of our international students that were visiting and studying were located in one of the buildings that collapsed. It's been a very severe and terrible time for Christchurch actually in a small well-knitted community. For general homes outside of the inner city, one of the biggest debilitating experiences has been the sea of mud of um, liquefaction that's affected many of the low-lying areas. Christchurch isn't the greatest place to have built a city on a swamp uh, and peat and that sort of effect of the velocity of um, the earthquake and that shifting has sent mud through um, many homes. But also the, just the daily reality of living in a city where its main public buildings and public space has been collapsed and then con controlled in terms of our access and entry and ability to get around has been very difficult on the psyche of New Zealanders who we know from separate interviews really value their ability to access space and their ability to get around and get away easily. It's a big part of, of what it means to be a New Zealander. So loss of public space, loss of the ability to move around easily is something that you can't underestimate in terms of its sort of psyche on a community. Earthquakes and all natural hazards have a way of revealing more about a community than just the kind of underlying geological uh, faults and stresses. And it is a way in which um, you start thinking very differently about your social and economic structures. Think Differently itself is a little campaign that came from um, one of the projects we call Gap Filler, which has been a series of, of arts events that have sprung up around the city um, in the vacant spaces created by the loss of buildings. Um, because the City Council and, and Government Recovery took over a lot of uh, libraries as public space, we also lost access to libraries. So the community um, used some of the uh, refrigerators and, and household equipment that had been lying around, turned them into lending libraries, where we just had different opportunities, just had different access to information. In fact, we, in fact Prosperity Without Growth was led from here, so it was transition um, town handbook and others were just were sharing and networking and in this particular refrigerator just about a block from our house a thousand people have used it within the first day so um, so there's good things that happen and the immediate after effect of the earthquake were the things that Rebecca Solnitz records in her Paradise Built in Hell that sense of compassion and collaboration and there was a sort of a surge of of mutual goodwill, the community rallied together to come with uh, to a series of share and idea events about how they might want to see their inner city developed, um, what they do want and in this case um, what they don't want. Uh, the government has largely focused on the economic recovery of the country and if you know much about New Zealand we are a highly deregulated market looking outward. Probably it's about the worst kind of developed economy to have an earthquake in because the focus then for government recovery has been around how we can reattract international investment and tourism and the focus has been around how we can redevelop the central city and bring back both the tourist dollar and also uh, development and investment in the city. The government uh, suspended the constitution and um, called a state of emergency in the first few weeks after the earthquake which was really needed in order to pull together resources but it then chose a command and control model of government response, which we've also seen developed after Hurricane Katrina, where they um, brought down a central government department and created basically a new government department we call SERA, the Canterbury Earthquake Authority, um, 
Recovery Authority in town to sit alongside in an awkward and uneasy relationship with our elected city council. And then gradually and then pretty rapidly actually, the government took over the responsibilities for the city council for city rebuilding and issued its own 100 day plan for the recovery of the city, which included a temporary um, series of um, pop-up malls. We had a pop-up city mall in the central city uh, made out of containers. Um, and then a plan has been rolled out for the development of the central city um, within 100 days. But aside from the kind of emphasis within a very small central city, and the new central city will be a lot smaller in its land footprint, we're left with the problem of vast areas of space being cleared in a relatively low income community. The experience of just living with ongoing bulldozing, this was taken a couple of um, weeks ago from about a few blocks from where we live, it, and just living in this kind of setting is really quite difficult. So even um, the most resilient, well, this is my elderly neighbour's house, who when I was working here last year in June, when another really large earthquake um, struck, had been defiantly putting her fallen off chimney pots outside her house and planting them. But it's hard to keep that up and to keep the confidence of spring in the Garden City when um, three weeks ago this was her house after what, this, what the community has experienced in the last 18 months is over 8,000 aftershocks, 50 of which have been um, magnitude 5 or larger of separate earthquake events. And that, that is constantly eroding. In, um, in our neighbour's case, it's a good news story in that she has wanted to move on, she's been able to get her house pulled down, looks forward to rebuilding and being reinsured. But for many homeowners right now, we're in a very tough period in which not a lot has happened since I last spoke to you. Um, and many people are still living in homes that are badly damaged, they're still dealing with earthquake insurance claims, they're still trying to get some traction. And there is a deep-seated discomfort that's often recorded in you know, the process of how you get through a disaster. There's this winters of discontent, well this is our second winter of discontent, but it is very difficult. Um, and there's also this other thing about this public grief that happens in these experiences. Um, as you're shut out of your inner city and you are losing the heritage buildings, you may not have felt that attached to them, but it is your shopping centres, your churches, your schools, your libraries, your art galleries, your just points of reference. And a lot of people speak about feeling um, alienated in their own landscape, not knowing what's going on at the moment, and a kind of a shared public grief really about what it's like to live in a city where you are both excluded from the central city and also watching so many historic buildings being pulled down rapidly. Um, rapidly and I have to say with very little debate. I took um, this photo originally but it, it's really come to symbolise what it feels like to be a citizen in a disaster in this kind of controlled government response. Um, <coughs> in the last month the government has also announced a suspension of regional elections until 2016 on the grounds that um, it's more efficient to make decisions uh, with appointed commissioners and that the community has enough to be getting on with. Which is very interesting given that water in Canterbury is one of our major issues and has been a really particularly <coughs> important issue for the public. Um, apparently we're all too preoccupied with our tarpaulins and our fallen houses to be wanting to exercise the vote or have a say in our regional decision making. It's much more efficient to have appointed commissioners. now. The appointed commissioners are probably doing a particularly good job and it's very interesting this whole debate between technocrats versus elected officials. But my argument would be if they're doing such a good job, let them stand for election and gain a public mandate. And this feeling, um, in, you can make a change in a small community up to a point. So this is the wall that, that's at the end of the pop-up shopping mall, which was originally solid wood. A couple of Facebook comments about wouldn't it be nice to have windows and someone responds, my husband is on the planning committee, I'm talking about windows in. So we get windows to look at our inner city being rebuilt, but it kind of symbolises what it feels like to be on the outside, not engaged. The final straw for the community came just a couple of weeks ago, when the government announced a decision to also reorganise all the schools in the Canterbury region in the wake of the earthquakes. But this reorganisation, many of these decisions have been planned or thought about, and a lot of them are quite important, 
but the communities have depended on their schools to recover. In the absence of, um, of churches as traditional kind of church going has, has waned, our community schools have been a really important site for community recovery. They have fed the community, they've often housed the community, people have been going in there for support. If this was a developing country, we would be shocked that a government would move so quickly to reorganise its schools. What is also more alarming is that um, a minority party um, coalition partner to our government has announced that it wants to implement or introduce um, a new system of charter or academy schools that are private. And we have a very strong state system in New Zealand. We have four months to be consulted on the closure of 13 and the reorganisation of 26, but actually in effect when you look at the amalgamation of other schools, it's a large area of the school uh, districts that are being reorganised. And right now in these four months the community are exhausted and they just need time. So that sparked a whole series of um, public protests. Um, to particularly because Christchurch was the centre for the suffrage movement in New Zealand. Kate Shepherd, the suffragette, and, um, and John Hall began from Canterbury. They led the community, and New Zealand became the first country to give women the vote, but it came from Christchurch. So the re result of feeling shut out from your recovery has made and brought, um, the community feel both excluded and, and and, um, and powerless. And while they may agree with many of the changes, they want to be part of the change process, not have it put on them. So it's a very tense time politically at the moment. Um, and uh, it's an interesting time because it's been a series of protests that have been intergenerational and across cultures and within a small city. So. At this point, I then come back to this book and the work that I've been doing around um, children and citizenship. found myself in the role of um, also supporting and developing a protest involving both kids and communities to kind of try to bring back democracy, and we've called it, you know, Rebuild With Our Vote, uh, and we're resurrecting the petition that Kate Shepherd used to bring the vote back and um, to bring the vote for women. And kids and families around the city are both going online, but they're also rolling out this giant petition which eventually will take up to Parliament. But in this process, I've been thinking a lot, and much more in practical level than I expected, about the work that we've been doing in Christchurch. So now, to turn back, first, just before I talk about that, to put the kind of Christchurch lessons into more of a global context, which is something I've really appreciated being able to do here at Resolve, um, and at CES and now Sustainable Lifestyles. Hannah Arendt, the philosopher, rightly reminds us that we should be very cautious about teaching children about politics. Her argument is that totalitarian regimes frequently ch um, target children, uh, that children's cognitive ability is emerging and they can be easily manipulated. I think we can take on board her caution, but we don't have to agree with her that education should come before a political awareness, to recognise that children are also citizens in our communities now, in the sense of being and belonging in our communities, wanting to have their voice heard. And our task is to support children for the role that they are already taking on as citizens in renewing a common world. So while we take on that caution, it's how can we support citizens? And Globally, when you start listening to children, half the world's population is now under the age of 25. And they face four common problems, I would argue. The first is a change in climate. Or in Christchurch, we're thinking, and, and a kind of a more dangerous environment. In Christchurch, at the moment, we're thinking just physically about physical hazards. But actually, if we think about changing climates, much of the discussions is still quite confused, and it a community level, people are struggling to understand that the way in which a change in climate will be experienced is in more severe and unexpected weather at local levels. So in Christchurch and in New Zealand generally, while we understand the debates about climate change at one level, it's taking longer to actually really understand them at a local and personal level. So for instance, for the children of the far north in the North Island on the east coast, particularly in small, low-desire, which is our poorest um, communities like Kaio, 
they've been flooded with, they're experiencing um, severe coastal erosion and floods. They've had um, five major storm events since 2007. Last year in 2011 the community was flooded out at both the beginning and the end of the year. Down in Canterbury in the east coast of the South Island our experience of a change in climate is growing um, arid conditions which is difficult when you're a dairy farming industry. Um, <coughs> but uh, for children they've become used to changing ozone land, you know, the slip, slop, slap and the, and the hat. But actually how children are going to experience this heat, and especially in urban communities as well, and the complicated effects of a changing climate for new diseases and the spread of viruses that we haven't seen from the Pacific and virus-borne illnesses on mosquitoes like dinghy fever into New Zealand are all new things we need to think about. And it will be complicated for children, as it is everywhere. So the changing climate is one of the big issues that will define the future of this generation growing up. But the second that we're all aware of is the unprecedented levels of global youth unemployment, which the ILO last week um, reminded us are not going to easily go away. We are used to thinking and we've, about global youth unemployment, particularly here in Europe around the, the now really startling statistics like the 55% unemployment in Greece, the 53% um, of youth unemployment in Spain. But what we less used to having national conversations about is what proportion of our un unemployed are young. And in economies which are good at growing financial wealth if they can, and extracting resources at, at unsustainable rates, and not necessarily creating new and meaningful work. So the consequence of that has been, for instance, that since 2009, New Zealand has led the OECD in our proportionate share of unemployed being young, 16 to 25 year olds. And one of the reasons for that is that we're particularly bad at keeping the 16 to 18 year old in school or work. Um, we've got a series of new innovative policies that the government's developed to try and provide wraparound care for um, the young potentially school leaver uh, who hasn't got a job necessarily to go into around training. Last week we took quite a retrograde step in terms of also bringing in minimum youth wages, forgetting that actually this is a global problem that we all share, but the proportion of our young people who are making up our unemployment is also as important as how many. And while we can see statistics like recently the um, statistics here in the UK about um, a, a fall in youth unemployment, the fact that these are jobs that are mini jobs, that are small, that are uncertain, means that we're not looking at a sustainable or, or long-term solution to this problem. So the economy is a problem for all young people and won't go away, but so too is growing social inequality. It's a problem for all of our countries, in the UK, I know that you're very aware of, and there have been lots of debates about the fact that the UK leads the OECD in terms of the greatest level of social immobility between father and son, as it's quaintly measured in the OECD. That means, you know, your income will not be better than your father's, and in fact, this is probably this is the first generation where you will be worse off. So while we're having this conversation in the UK, we are slower to have the conversation in New Zealand, a country that's prided itself on being a settler, a new world country, um, that actually over the last 20 years, it's been New Zealand and Sweden that have experienced the greatest rate of income inequality growth between our rich and poor. So while we don't have the uber wealth, the gap has grown faster. And while there are lots of measures of that, and there have been moments at which it's stalled, its consequence for, um, for our children has been very difficult. It's left them in a very exposed position. On one level, our elderly are doing very well. Only 2% of the elderly in New Zealand live at 50% or less of the median income. We have a high universal superannuation scheme, and uh, we've done, much like Sweden, in, co in dealing with inequality, we've done a good job at redistributing. But our young people, so consequently our elderly are living a, basically a life quality similar to Sweden on much lower incomes. Our children are in a very difficult and different position. At the most conservative measures, uh, at least 15% are living at 50% or less of the median income. Other rates are estimating it's about over, over 25%. So while the elderly and the young are both going into a very difficult economic climate in the next and, and environmental change and other pressures, our children are doing it from a, a very difficult starting position. 
And this material deprivation gap isn't really understood and is part of a very difficult set of political discussions we have to have in a community dominated by baby boomers at the ballot box. It also has some real serious consequences for actually youth well-being. New Zealand's dreadful statistic is not that we lead the world, that terrible statistic is Russia, who leads the world for youth suicide, but we lead the OECD. So young New Zealanders are killing themselves at a rate higher than any other country. And it's particularly a difficult problem for young Māori men, but also increasingly for young women. And we've had a series of policies around how we report this in the media. We've tried to contain the debates, we've tried to not report the debate. Uh, we were equal to Sweden, uh, sorry, to Finland. Finland's introduced a number of policies which have, ta have tackled this, one of which seems to be regulation of alcohol, but it doesn't explain all of it. And thinking about the difficult ways in which young people are experiencing social and economic change and the complexity of it is part of what drove me to write the book. Because it's not obvious what is actually driving it. If you look, for instance, at Spain and Italy with high youth unemployment, their um, experiences of suicide are quite different. But my suggestion, especially working alongside and listening to the Indigados, is that there are small contributions that we can make to the wider discussion as political scientists about the effect of a democratic imagination in, in, in turning some of this energy outwards to actually focus on the situation in which you're growing up rather than this inward suffering. But it's only a very small contribution to a very complex <coughs> and wider debate. So economic change is having consequences along with climate change and along with growing social inequality. But the fourth um, headline issue I just want to focus on before looking at the three models and finishing is the way in which all of our communities are struggling um, as democracies to hold financial and global power to account. So as we've deregulated, as we've entered into export agreements, as we've grown, as our focus has become more outward looking, we are also struggling as countries to hold big investors to account, to actually make decisions meaningful at our local area. One of the causes or, um, of sort of disillusionment and kind of a, a feeling that voting doesn't matter that's particularly strong amongst young people isn't that they don't care, isn't that they're apathetic, but actually that they feel it doesn't make a difference. And that feeling is shared, um, the Nottingham Trent studies also picked up that same feeling of, you know, actually we're not sure that this is going to make a difference because we know that young people turn out to vote in their thousands when they're given a really tight horse race, when they're given a meaningful choice, they'll vote. If they feel like it's not making a difference, they won't. So despite this disillusionment, what I find really encouraging is that young people are turning out onto the streets through UK Cut, through student protests, through Twitter, through Facebook. They're not giving up. But in their protests, what are we doing to actually support their voice? And I appreciated the opportunity to think about this here in the UK um, from December 2010 when the first of the student fees protests were um, beginning. I was um, down at Westminster and I was thinking, looking at the reception committee <coughs> that's waiting here, before the first of the protests arrived, what kind of democracies are we becoming where we feel we need to protect ourselves from our young <coughs> citizens and their demands? And I was thinking about this again, about the responsibilities that we as adult citizens have to support young citizens as they're going into this very different world. When I saw this iconic image that came out of the recent Madrid protests of the, um, of the bartender defending the protesters, and thinking, what responsibilities do we <coughs> have if we are all in this together to stand alongside young citizens as they're dealing with these really big issues? because their world is going to be very different. So I think one of the things we need to think about is the way in which our citizenship, what we're actually doing, our politics, is actually leaving a legacy for a new generation and creating a way of, of thinking about problems that could actually make the situation better or worse. We've got used to thinking about our environmental impacts leaving an ecological footprint, but what I want to suggest now is that we also leave a kind of democratic or social impact on the communities around us. And I want to talk about three sort of citizenship handprints that I see emerging. 
And when I talk about a citizenship handprint or a social handprint, what I'm thinking about is the way in which we influence both agency, which is the ability of, of citizens to imagine and affect change, also how we influence our environment and where we see citizenship belonging, how we influence how we think decisions should be made, both the way in which we make the decisions and the justice of those decisions, and actually what are the consequences of that for, um, for our political imagination. So in the last few minutes, I just want to focus on these kind of three dominant models that I see emerging. Um, it came partly from a study that we ran over four years in New Zealand, listening to young children growing up. But then I really appreciated the chance to work um, on this here with um, Tim Jackson and colleagues here at Resolve when we were working with the United Nations Environment Programme study to also listen to young people in 18 other countries about the issues facing them. And one of the first models that really strikes me is, is a kind of a handprint that we're leaving behind which is very authoritarian. In democracies we like to think that it's not a democracy but it, that it is authoritarian, uh, that it's uh, it's other kinds of dictatorships that, for instance, frustrate agency, where you see young, young children being used as child soldiers, slave labour, child prostitution. But actually, we subtly and sometimes quite coercively frustrate youth agency or their ability to imagine and affect change when we do things like change the education maintenance allowance, affect educational opportunities, affect chances for advancement in work or employment shut down opportunities to listen, to communicate, to affect um, a difference. We also can really control where young people experience, or any citizen, experiences their natural world and their kind of place to be. We have almost sort of lost sight of the way in which we are physically containing and constraining where it, it's okay to assemble, where the free places are to be, where the public space is to come together to be citizens. And that happens subtly through things like just sheer lack of space to, to gather, to play freely, unless it's controlled commercial space or it's surveillance space or it's space that, as Nicola Green and I have been working on a project about the use of those um, alarms, the mosquito alarms, which are outside supermarkets and shopping <coughs> malls, which keep kids away from places that you don't want. I mean, all sorts of things that we do, um, as well as kettling and physically actually constraining people where we don't want them to be or not to control them. The authoritarian decision making speaks for itself, but the retributive justice, which I hear has re entered political lexicon in England in this last week, that, that justice modelling it as blame. So the faults of the economy are all the fault of those bad bankers, those greedy bankers. The, the fault of, in New Zealand, the fault of social welfare is all the fault of, um, of those solo parents or feral children or, you know, the, the language of blame and retribution is, it becomes very dominant in this kind of sort of model of thinking. And it, it silences children's imagination and our own imagination. In the New Zealand case, for example, it can be quite subtle. In a family, um, we asked you, one child, in your family you said your dad's in charge, does he listen to you? Uh, not really, because when he's drunk he doesn't. Thinking about parent alcoholism, and alcoholism is a way in which we're silencing agency, domestic violence, we're not often thinking about this in politics, but actually for children this is their reality. And Crail, one of the ch children, says, well some people, lots of people are smart enough to care about the world and they can protest, that's the four best way you can make a difference in your community. To which um, Ben says, can you protest against your mum? And Bob says, oh, if I did, she'd give me a smack. And Brittany asks, but what about the new anti-smacking law? Bob says, oh, she doesn't care about that. Uh, and actually, in that <coughs> conversation, levels of physical abuse for Pacific and Māori communities is really large. And I'm just going to be able to get this. Um, so that frustration of agency is, is, a, is a big problem, and it silences imagination. But we do it in lots of ways. And I was thinking about it a lot in the wake of the um, English riots about particularly what was happening in England. And while it's an incredibly complex situation here, I think it is that we do need to actually keep thinking about the kind of citizenship we're modeling because a, a riot and a rebel is not a citizenry. So how are we actually going to deal with frustrated agency? <coughs>
On a more positive note, the kind of other dominant model that we see emerging is what I call the, the model of smart um, citizenship for thin environmentalism, in which we see a lot of emphasis on the citizen as the self-help agent. So what we see in that kind of approach is that we um, are teaching children and also think about our own citizenship as what I can do, the responsible self for making differences in my community. We teach a lot of service learning, we teach a lot of volunteerism. We, you know, what can you do to make a difference? And we encourage young citizens to focus their energy and their activity in the marketplace. So their relationship with their environment is particularly driven through a lens of the market. So if they're not going to shop to their drop to prove that they're, that they're part of a society, then we ask them to shop thoughtfully, to be ethical consumers, or to invent new products and to be entrepreneurs, to engage in the market, to take financial control of their lives and to think about financial literacy and to think about their, their market um, citizenship. We also teach a set of um, ideas about justice that, and model a set of ideas that are contractual or a priori, a set of given rules. We teach respect for the law, we ask students and, and each other to respect contracts that can be used in the market. Uh, we have class contracts, we uh, use a social contract and expect that everybody's entered into it freely and willingly from a similar kind of place. We have a set of rules that we try to roll out in universal situations. And we also encourage and put a great deal of emphasis on representative decision making. We have student councils, we encourage people to <coughs> vote. We're very worried if people aren't voting, you know, we want them to vote, we want them to take part, to choose leaders, um, and we look to kind of a leadership. And a lot of our political imagination becomes technological transformation, so that a lot of our thinking is around how can we create new solar panels? How can we um, retrofit our houses? How can we be, live nudge people to live sustainable lives uh, that, are, that are greener and kind of a new green economy? And you see this come through in quite, um, in quite interesting ways when kids are talking about their environment. They say, people are born with magnificent brains these days. Um, Tom says, we could shoot rubbish into space. We could fire it into the sun. And Red says, yeah, to burn it up. And Bob says, well, we could um, get all the, a giant container and we could put gases into it and then we could chuck it into space and, and get some kind of energy to contribute to, you know, making things better without climate change. Now, there's nothing wrong with the, with the smart model, but the difficulty is that it leaves unchallenged and unquestioned the underlying injustices that are driving the unsustainability that's affecting our world and actually creating the problems that we're living in. And I suppose it was just really after I wrote the book that actually just back at home as I was watching the isolation of the children in my community as they are struggling to deal with the fact that their schools which have supported them through the quake may be closed, they may be asked to go to another <coughs> school, amalgamated, and I was thinking about the remarkable lessons that schools in particular teach children when they are community democratic schools about how we act collaboratively but I thought what else can we be doing and also when you interview kids in this smart model they are often eco warriors so they're terrified about the environment and feel that they can't make a difference so you then get this pathology of sort of denial and, and, and distancing so what else could we do and in order to do that I went back to um, both listening to our children but also to my own students at the University of Canterbury, um, Sam Johnson who became Young New Zealander of the Year and six other students who organised on Facebook. Within two days they had about 100 students. By the time the February quake happened they were organising 24,000 students, 10,000 a day on the ground to clean up the city and the role modelling for that at multiple levels for how we actually engage and how we actually collaborate is quite remarkable. Um, especially given the kind of scale of what we were dealing with in general exhaustion. So the model I'd like to leave that I see as another emergent model and of, how, of the kind of citizenship we might be creating and leaving behind is what I call a seeds model of, of ecological um, citizenship in which first we encourage citizens to think of themselves as social agents to think of collective action and to think of themselves as belonging to inclusive communities. And that's very difficult to do in communities that have experienced rapid migration and rapid change. But how do we actually encourage this kind of collaborative thinking? <coughs>
How do we encourage environmental education that is both substantive because we do need knowledge. You do need to know about the world around you. But also in an, in an education that allows unfettered free access to space to be so that you have an affinity to the places around you. And in a highly mobile world, and many of these, this generation for instance, of under 14 year old children in Christchurch that we interviewed, are part of this global cohort, highly mobile. So how are they actually building affinity in urban areas to their environment? And I think that um, we are often not so much suffering from a nature attention deficit disorder as an adult attention deficit disorder. We're not listening to the issues that really trouble children, the environmental concerns that they're experiencing are not just um, climate change, but they're, they are things like domestic alcoholism, graffiti, or thinking about um, Kate Birmingham's study, rainforests are a long way from here. In different communities that are a long way from the Amazon, their environmental issues will be different. So how do we tap into and really listen to those concerns? And part of that is also how do we model and teach a different kind of justice that's not based on a priori contract rules, but on actually the moral reasoning of day-to-day -day living, what Anata Sen calls practical justice. Um, it's become very important in a situation in Christchurch where, you know, after an, a disaster, you actually want citizens who can think about what the right thing is to do. So moral reasoning is not just learning a preset of rules, but it's actually trying to think about both the outcomes of decisions, what's fair and what's unfair, the distributional justice, the procedural justice, like how do we make fair decisions, but also, more challengingly, especially for teachers, the issues of, um, of how we advance justice, how we deal with the injustice we see around us, and how we actually fix it. And that takes us into a much more activist and liberationist approach to learning than many schools feel comfortable or confident to deal with. But that's the kind of world that kids are growing up in, where they're actually going to need the skills of critical resistance, not just the ability to actually take a set of rules and respect the law, but know when to say no when something is actually really wrong. Also, we need to get a lot of, to think about ways in which we can decenter or move away from thinking that we act locally. We think globally and we act locally. Because if you live in a small community, you know <coughs> that local communities can be hotbeds for, for oppression and for injustice and for infighting. It used to be hard to talk about how we decenter deliberation until the Arab Spring and Occupy. <clears throat> but how do we actually connect all our local conversations so that we can step out and see the big picture? In a world of carbon um, footprinting, when we're conscious about every time we travel, how are we actually going to have these conversations? Which is why it's great when we can do things like YouTube. But for small societies that are isolated, in even countries like New Zealand, Actually, you can very quickly become very isolated. In Europe, it's quite easy to say you're not going to travel because you've got lots of dialogue going on around you. But for other countries, hooking our conversations into a national an international conversation is very difficult without opportunities for face-to-face -face exchange. So we do need to think about how we tell stories and also how we maintain our values of democracy through self-transcendence. We focus so much on what I can do now, right now, that isn't actually going to sustain democratic or long-term values. So how do we stretch out our thinking? Not just um, materialism, so we're not just thinking about material day-to-day -day living, but actually how do we stretch out our ideas about time and place? So we've discovered in Christchurch, for instance, coming back home, that actually for children faced with the problems that they've experienced with the earthquakes and the closure of their schools, it's been enormously important to connect with older citizens in their protests and to draw on the legacy of the suffragettes to feel that in the past there have been similar battles. It will take time, but we will get there. Other I, people have used um, spiritual or religious discussion. Anything that lifts you beyond thinking about yourself is part of this conversation of democracy that we need to start thinking about and engaging with. So, um, in 1965, to just conclude, Rachel Carson, the ecologist, talked about needing to nurture a child's sense of wonder about their natural world. 
in the book and through the experience of the earthquakes and working here at Surrey and with um, the Tyndall Centre, I've been thinking very much that we also need to nurture a child's sense of wonder about their natural world and about the extraordinary possibilities of ordinary people acting together to affect change for a more just and sustainable future. Thank you very much. Sorry that I discovered that that was a lot longer than the half an hour post quake. But if people no, but you've done you've done really well, and we've got you know, 10, 15 minutes for for coming questions, comments, lots of discussion. So things people would like to check. Well, while people kind of formulate their, 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 their questions, I mean, the, the one I suppose I've got is, is you present a, in some ways not, not an optimistic view, but you, you present a, a, a possible way to, to move forwards. Um, do you see, and, and you know, you've obviously drawn a lot of that from the experiences that you've seen within Christchurch and, and within New Zealand, do you see much prospect for turning around the, the, the political process and the way in which citizenship and, and in particular children are engaged with citizenship within your own setting, your own country, your own your own city? Or is this really about taking those experiences and, and hopefully having having a model that might be embedded in, in other places at, at other times? I, I think it's two things. I think it's not so much embedding a model as opening up conversations because what has struck me in working both with Christchurch but also working away is, is how similar our experiences are at the moment. So earthquakes feel like austerity. It, actually, it, it's what they feel like. Um, not obviously when you're having one, but the consequence of it and how you recover. Um, and there are lots of similarities. So I think we are at really key choice moments now. Um, the debates that we're having here in the UK are mirror images of the debates that we're having in New Zealand about actually how we move forward. What, the decisions that you make for education now, not just about citizenship, but around actually the kind of schools that you're developing and modelling and who has access to them, the decisions about energy use, the decisions about climate, about taxation, those are decisions about the future. How we're we actually going to deal with the fact, as Amata Sen says, we can't any longer say, well, your culture is fine in your world and mine's fine in my world, because now we live bang smack up against each other. So how are we actually going to work alongside each other and move forward as communities? Um, and those, I sort of love Bonnie Honoig's work. She wrote the book Emergency Politics. And she talks about, again, drawing from Hannah Arendt, but talking about needing to found and re-found democracy every day and about actually in every situation finding that new way forward that is democratic and that's why I don't think we can kind of always rely on the past existence of rules and established procedures because actually we can't keep suspending democracy every time we have an emergency from an earthquake to climate change. We actually have to have a way in which we can make decisions democratically through a rapidly changing world and I think that's a choice. And I don't think there is no alternative. I don't think we have to go to retribution of justice and austerity policies. We have a choice as a community how we respond. But when communities are shell-shocked and they're tired, they need to be dissented. They need to have other people's conversations to remind them that this isn't the only narrative. There are other ways to be. And that's why I've so valued the fellowship with Surrey, for that opportunity to just be listening to other conversations so that when we are locked in our little earthquake or you're locked in austerity or we're actually still getting ideas from each other. Well, thank you very much, very, very inspiring. Um, I'm wondering how the government has responded to the grassroots movement with the 20, 25,000 um, volunteers doing this up because they, 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 there's plenty of opportunities for some conflict and for some, some um, austerity that's a very interesting question. Uh, initially, um, civil defence and, uh, and the local government were extremely resistant to the students being involved. And that again is a FEMA, the US experience of, there's a strong suspicion of citizen organised voluntary movements. And actually, um, it was the mayor of the city who has a, um, a background in 
politics and television, uh, who who also could see the opportunity for engaging with young activists and young citizens. But the focus was very much on, okay, so we use the students, but we use them for mud clearing and silt. But sometimes worry about actually the long-term consequences of what we, all the students were digging and you know what we were actually dealing with. And it became very um, sort of a, a demarcation thing that civil defence dealt with bodies and recovery and we had kind of high alert swap groups in town and communities were engaged with students. But you know, the unexpected beauty of that was that lots of elderly residents, lots of people in their homes spoke movingly and in tears about what it felt like to be in a collapsed house, to be surrounded by mud and to look up the road and to see 500 young people coming at you with shovels <laughs> and that, it's a very moving you know and and it completely changed a conversation about how we think about the value of youth um, and I think it's an important conversation to have here in Britain because as we all know Britain came out at the bottom of the last year's um, EU survey on attitudes and respect for young people uh, and actually in a disaster in a war in an emergency where does your energy and your drive come from? It comes from your kids. And, and the effect that they gave of supporting the elderly was remarkable. So, um, so yes, uh, it, there was a really a, a, a fear, I think, initially amongst some of the administrators about this uncontained, exuberant energy that could go in any way. They're also very lucky that you have a, a national psyche in New Zealand that was uh, that we value practical politics. We're not particularly good at reasoning. We're very good at getting things done. You know, we're not good at having public reasoned engagement. We're very suspicious of old world intellectualism. We just like to get things done. So that's experienced as youthful, pragmatic politics of let's just dig out the silt. Trouble is actually, in a disaster, you also need to stop and, and really think now, what are we gonna do? Not just rush ahead and replay in the city in exactly the same spot, but actually use this chance to think carefully about what we're doing. Well, I'm making sweeping generalizations about my country. <laughs> but, it, but we do actually, it, it, we do really have a characteristic about that number eight line that comes through in our politics. It's quite remarkable. What, yes, Simon. Um, well, you, you talked, or oh, you took briefly on like, the EMA uh, protests. Uh, and where I was in Lancaster when that was happening, you had a lot of the students that were too young to engage in traditional democratic processes uh, who came out onto the streets. And it was quite a large demonstration. And it wasn't university students, these were 15, 16 year old kids. And my experience with that was that all the, the non youths, they were, the, the, the people in power, their schools threatened them with exclusion and suspension if they did take part in the protest. The police, when they were out, wouldn't allow them to approach other schools. Uh, it was very contained, which I guess comes back to the environmental exclusion you were talking about. And I wondered, in light of things like that, how, how optimistic can you be about the, about the ability to nurture a child's sense of wonder about their democratic world? Well, I think you're absolutely right. And in fact, it was those protests and being there with lots of those really young kids. I mean, that's what staggered me, being here in Britain at the first of those protests. And what wasn't reported was that large number of young 14, 15 year olds who were there for a separate reason. And um, and it was a muddle. You know, you're learning in politics. You know, there was a whole lot of stuff. It's not sainthood that people were out there protesting. But there was a sort of a sense of something not right and it was a kind of a, a missed opportunity for listening, I think. I wrote something for Open Democracy about it and that really drove the refocusing of the book. But this threatening, the way in which once kids become and learn to be centred in democratic ways becomes very threatening for authority. We've seen it with the Iraq protests as well. What do you do? We, and you know as a teacher what a pain it is when you've got that, that student who, you know, Gov described himself, Reith Gove described himself recently as the um, as the, the prat at the back of the class that made life hell for his French teacher. You know how difficult those students are and one of the problems that we're dealing with in education for democracy is at the moment we're educating the uber citizen. The young citizen who already has everything is getting more. So they're becoming very articulate, very sure that they know what's right. And 
Diana Hess has done some lovely work around this in the States, and so too has um, Joel Westfield in a wonderful um, piece called No Child Left Thinking, about actually how we encourage critical thinking for everyone. But I suppose in, <coughs> in, um, in closing, I would just think about the seeds of this democratic way of, of acting, about what actually taking part in a protest, or taking part in real engagement with the community on real issues, not pretend things in the classroom, but actually working with the community does. And there was a very simple thing that happened in one of the schools we were following, which was a, a city-wide protest about the closure of a local pool. And the children that took part in that with their parents and adults, even though the pool was closed afterwards, they had an accelerated experience of how politics works. And they were remarkably confident. Now, we can be cynical about protest, but, it, but there is something when you listen to this child, <coughs> Ashley, she says, you feel very important and special. You've got this kind of vibe inside you because you feel like you're getting heard and everyone in the world knows because you're shouting so loud and you're putting your whole heart towards something. And Rose says, maybe if the whole school got together with another school and then we all wrote letters, absolutely all of us, and then we all sent them to government, our council, and then we got signs and protest and then we had more and more people and lots of letters, then they wouldn't know what to do. And the interviewer says, so they'd have to listen? And Rose says, yep. Well, we might not agree with Rose's confidence that adults will listen, but I'm arguing we have to nurture that efficacy and that kind of that vision of how you might exercise your agency democratically. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, unless there are any burning last points, I guess that's a very nice, nice place to finish with. Is there any, any last things that people want to? Uh, Sorry, I've shut the conversation out. Sorry, Pete, <laughs> go on. One, one thing that sort of strikes me is that it's low trust, isn't it, really? Like, we've got sort of low trust societies. Um, we need more authorities and more mechanisms to, uh, if, if people don't trust each other, you know, top down, it, it, to me, it comes, it's like essentially the same in, in economies, you know, economies that function well. In some contexts, tend to have a higher trust, and it's the same with democracy. If you have very low trust, in the democracy, then you're going to need more mechanisms, more like the UK, you know, situation where we, we have all these things that we're discussing that come in to, to make sure that things function in the way that we see want them to. Yeah, that's a very interesting last point because it gives me a chance to say um, I actually think trust is overrated because actually you don't want citizens who can trust. Because trusting, I mean, because ironically, the lower the income, the less engaged you are with the politics, the more you trust your government. It's not just the, it's not just the individuals. It's exactly. The, it's, the, it's the people that are in power. Yeah, the, that needs, it's, the, it's that relationship of trust between those two different actors as well. Well, it's kind of, it's the ability to collaborate mm -hmm. and to respect rather than trust. But cynicism, it, cynicism is different from critical thought. The ability to actually think, I'm not sure that you're always going to be right. I actually need to be able to keep questioning you. Because if we don't keep thinking, keep questioning, keep challenging, then it is efficient to do decisions without democracy, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we get good decisions, that we get robust democracy. So I think perhaps the trust comes in our relationships with each other, in regrounding democracy with each other. So trusting collectively, but a healthy scepticism of government is a healthy society. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, you need some of that both. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Um, I think professionally, um, you know, you bring a fantastic, slightly different <coughs> slant, the kind of political science sort of aspect, perhaps, to, to some of our work. And political science is not a, a great strength, I think, here within CES, so that's, you know, you're adding that fantastic dimension, which has been really valuable and, and challenging, but, but, but really adds a lot. Uh, personally, I think those of us that have got children of our own, or children in prospects, or whatever, you know, it also, personally, is very challenging, because it makes me think that I need to go home and be seeds, not smart. Well, I know, there's nothing my not kids would say, I'm not very yeah. democratic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but I think personally, it then gives us all, yeah. you know, a lot, a lot to think about, and make sure that we're, uh, that, that, we're, we're thinking and acting in kind of progressive ways and not, uh, not, not, not going back the wrong way. So anyway, thank you very much. Thanks. I obviously do take a flyer. For the oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs>